is April 8th. Welcome to the Minnesota Tax Committee. Uh, we have a number of bills before us today, and we will start with uh, Senate File 0068. Senator Osmond, welcome to the committee. And uh, Senator Miller, would you move Senate File 68, please? Oh, I'm not hearing uh, from Senator Miller. Uh, Senator Weber, could you move Senate File 68 for us, please? So moved. Uh, thank you, uh, um, Senator Weber. Uh, Senator Osmick, welcome to the committee. Do you have any amendments? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. No, I do not. Okay, a uh, two-year bill, Senator Osmick. Thank you, Madam Chair. Members, uh, Senate File 68 is a COVID relief bill uh, to help businesses last year and this year who have been dealing with closures or reductions in their capacity. Uh, this bill in, its, uh, in, in the most simplest explanations says that if you had to close your business and only go or go to 50% capacity, you will either receive a 100% reduction or 50% reduction on income tax or corporate franchise tax that is paid to the state. This is determined by, by a formula that is inside the bill that, that uh, goes, to, um, it goes to the percentage and the month, number of months that are impacted to that business. Uh, and it is exclusive to a, uh, it is exclusive to just the tax, but tax years of 2020 and 2021. It will not continue into the future uh, hopefully the pandemic impact does not happen further into the future than the tax year 2021. Uh, currently, according to the fiscal note or the, the uh, fiscal analysis I was provided yesterday, the cost on this is a bit steep. 93,800,000 is the projected number. Uh, but considering we have a, uh, a, uh, a surplus uh, and our businesses, while they have been able to recover or uh, be able to tap to uh, funds from the federal government, uh, I think this is only right that if we as the state of Minnesota have impacted their businesses and uh, through executive order close them or reduce their capacity, that uh, they should have some relief in some manner. And in this particular case, it's on the corporate income tax or the individual income tax uh, that they would be paying in those two fiscal years. So with that, uh, Madam Chair, I don't believe I have any testifiers, and I appreciate your consideration. Uh, thank you, Senator Osmick. Pretty straightforward bill, um, capturing something that uh, so many of us are vastly concerned about. Uh, this does seem to be one of the tools in our toolbox to help mitigate some of this damage. Um, members, um, any comments or questions? Well, seeing none, uh, Senator Osmick, that is a very fast hearing. Uh, definitely um, appreciate your uh, take on this. And I understand that uh, it is a non-refundable uh, uh, as well, a tax credit. Is that correct? I don't know if you mentioned that. Uh, that is correct, Madam Chair. Yes. So uh, the tax credit would equal the, um, the uh, relative impact of those uh, percentage-wise of those um, closed businesses by executive order. And um, any other questions, members? Seeing none, uh, thank you, Senator Osmick. Uh, Senate file 68 will be laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, members, our next item is Senate file 1962. This is a Senator Jasinski bill. However, he is not able to present today, and I believe uh, Senator Chamberlain uh, and is an author on the bill. Senator Chamberlain, if you could kindly, or um, if you could kindly move your bill. Oh, you're not on the committee. All right, uh, Senator Bach, would you move Senate File 1926, please? I'll move, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Bach. Uh, Senator Jasinski, um, is there are there any amendments uh, to your bill? Well. Just to make sure here, Madam Chair. Oh, yes. Yeah, Senator Chamberlain is here, 
presenting for <laughs> since the, uh, 1926, and I am a member of the committee. So yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, I got my uh, wires crossed there as I was reading that agenda. So as a member of the committee, uh, an esteemed member of the committee, Senator Chamberlain, and an author on Senate File 1926, thank you for moving the bill. Uh, do you have any amendments, Senator Chamberlain? No, Madam Chair, we do not. All right. Uh, if you could um, introduce the bill, Senator please. Senator Jim Eagler. So, if it, you could kindly introduce the bill, please. Man, Madam Chair and members, so Senate File 1926, it's been around for a little while. I do, if I recall correctly, it's fairly simple. It's a sales tax exemption for the purchase, uh, right to purchase certain tickets to certain uh, collegiate sporting events. There are five particular events they're talking about. Now, the, there are conditions, as you see in the bill, it's fairly short. The conditions are the that right to purchase has to be used exclusively for scholarships, that, the, uh, that has to be separately listed on the receipt and the purchase price of the ticket. Thirdly, uh, there is a small calculation regarding greater of or equal to um, the price of admission has to be greater of greater or equal to the uh, some general admission tickets uh, nearest that area. So um, the goal is to exempt those dollars from sales tax that will be used exclusively for scholarships, and that is the. Uh, that is the heart of the bill. I believe I do have one testifier, Mr. Quincy Lewis. Thank you, Senator Chamberlain. Uh, Mr. Quincy Lewis, welcome to the committee. Uh, please introduce yourself for the record and uh, continue with your testimony. <coughs> uh, my name is uh, Quincy Lewis. Um, Chair Nelson, ranking member for us and the members of the committee. Um, Good morning and thank you for this opportunity. My name again is Quincy Lewis. I'm a graduate of the University of Minnesota. I'm a former Gopher basketball player and current director of the M Club. Uh, I'm here speaking to you today uh, because of my love for the university and the state of Minnesota that I call home. After I finished <clears throat> uh, my tenure professional career playing basketball, I returned home to Minnesota uh, with the dream of working at the U. I wanted to impact the next generation of golfers. I wanted to share my experience of, as a student athlete, as a professional, as a dad in these times, as a black man as well, um, because I wanted them to have a better experience than I had wearing the moon and gold. <coughs> I wanted to share my experience as C fans, Fred, uh, that and, and and share with them how I how I balance the metro campus as long as needs of agriculture and rural Minnesota. And also, too, I wanted to help break the stereotypes of who could love nature. I wanted to share my success on and off of the basketball court and also the sacrifices that it takes to win championships. I wanted to share with them my special opportunity that I got afforded when I was a part of the 96 Olympics as it came through Minneapolis on its way to Atlanta, Georgia. I want to share my experience winning a gold medal in New York and being able to represent my country wearing the red, white, and blue. I wanted to be a living example of a professional dream, being drafted and playing in three different European countries as a professional basketball player, but also to, to be an example of coming back and getting my degree and my master's and really showing that the ball, well, in my case, the air does go out of the ball, but at some point, sports does come to an end. And the last part, to come back and sh to show them that dreams do come true after playing sports. None of my success as a student athlete would have been possible without the resources and support at the university. They gave me the opportunity. So how did a kid from Little Rock, Arkansas get to Minneapolis? How did he find a St. Paul campus? How did he fall in love with natural resources, with the dream of being a teacher? He would go on to create a scholarship in his name to support kids that look like him 
that loved, had a love for science and outdoors, it was the ideal of a scholarship. This allowed me to dream bigger than just Little Rock, Arkansas. So I think about like, what if? What if we reduce the access to scholarships? Scholarships are the dreams that fill the you. Scholarships are the hope and the future for so many. We all want a strong University of Minnesota. We all want a strong state of Minnesota. Scholarships are a lifeline at the U because they connect, they empower, and they give access to dreamers like me who want it more. In athletics, this scholarship seating program brings equity to athletics. It balances the resources between revenue and non-revenue sports. It balances the resources between men and women. It balances the professional opportunities between the WNBA and the NBA and NHL and our new in WNHL, our women, new women's professional league, and the NFL and all of our Olympic sports. It balances the resources between people like me that was full scholarships and many of my friends that were walk-ons. And it also helps for us to eliminate the food deserts within our programs. This legislation will help us provide these opportunities. So what if your grandson, granddaughter, niece, or nephew wants to play sports in college? What advice would you give them? Well, it's simple, right? Work hard enough in the classroom and in your sport, and you'll get a scholarship. Today, I'm asking you for help to make sure that the state of Minnesota and University of Minnesota system can live as promised to the access of scholarship if you excel in the classroom and have a love and a talent for a sport. Because it's bigger just than just the Twin Cities campus or Duluth campus, it's not only about winning games, but it's also about changing lives. There's no better story than a kid growing up and walking distance from the U that hears the sounds of football games and dreams to be a gopher and wins a Super Bowl like Tyler Johnson, or one of our soccer women's soccer goalie from Plymouth that has the opportunity to play for a hometown team. And just recently, a adopted kid raised on the south side of, of Minneapolis grows up to play for the Gophers to return to become a head coach of the Gophers in our men's basketball program. Why is this, be <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> why is this important? Because scholarships are the bridge between dreams and reality. So thank you so much this, this morning for allowing me to have the opportunity and thank you for your support. Uh, of the University of Minnesota. So if there's any questions, uh, I will be happy to help. Oh, thank you, Mr. Lewis. Uh, compelling testimony. Uh, congratulations uh, on your um, athletic success and your academic success, and most importantly, on your civic-minded engagement uh, post-athletic, uh, post-Olympics, and uh, post the University of Minnesota. As an alumni myself, uh, certainly, I know that there is great support for the U across the Minnesota Senate and, and across our state. Um, I, I'm sorry that we were not able to meet in person. I would have asked you to bring that gold medal. I've never had an opportunity to see one live. Uh, but again, um, thank you for that testimony. I have a, a question uh, for uh, Senator uh, Chamberlain or uh, maybe Mr. Lewis, but I think it might be a Senator Chamberlain question. Um, so I'm, I, I am kind of trying to understand. So obviously the importance of the U, the importance of scholarships is absolutely key. And particularly, I like the part about the equity uh, amongst all of the uh, sports. We know some produce more revenue than others. Uh, and so my question is, how would this scholarship bill um, impact that? In other words, um, we know that certain sports uh, bring in a lot of receipts at the gates uh, and uh, others do not. But uh, to Mr. Lewis's comments, uh, the equity of ensuring that all of these sports are equally supported uh, through scholarships, how does this bill get to that point? Well, this might might be a better question for Mr. Lewis, but um, if maybe I'll get to part of it by just simply saying, the, as as you're aware, the exemption is on part of the price that is separately stated, and the revenue note uh, points out that it's about nine hundred thirty thousand dollars a year, 
and it's a number of scholarships right now the that they're paying taxes on the, the fiscal the revenue notice also states that the u reported about 12 million dollars of scholarship money that has been uh, taxed so um there's 12 million dollars in the pot they're using now this would be another just under a million dollars to add to the scholarship now madam chair if you're asking particulars about process and how this would be equally applied against the other sports. For example, some sports uh, produce obviously more revenue, uh, men's basketball, men's football, than other sports would. So perhaps I would defer to Mr. Lewis for a breakdown of that particular uh, part of it, if that's what you're asking. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Timberland. Yes, it is. And I'll get back to the um, $11 million or $12 million, uh, with you next. But so yes, uh, Mr. Lewis, can you kind of uh, further elaborate uh, on that aspect of um, equality uh, amongst the sports uh, and how this <laughs> bill would um, would help promote that? Yes, yeah, so, you know, <clears throat> first and foremost, academics is our number one priority. So when it comes to our budget, that is the first thing that we spend our budget on is paying for our students to have an education. So when you think about how the budget is laid out after that whatever is left is kind of what is spread between the teams so uh, we do pay a scholarship bill uh, so that is not forgiven so uh, a lot of times our budget is dictated about paying for our student athletes to go to college supporting them in every single way and then what's left in the budget is how the funds are distributed between the teams and giving them the extra access that they need so with us it's all about scholarships. So this money here is to go and help for our scholarships. So, and um, so that's really, really the reason why it allows us to be equitable in everything that we do. Thank you. Um, I'll have to get some more uh, information on that. I don't, I, I don't see where, uh, how that would um, increase more, uh, how this particular proposal would increase more scholarships for, uh, women's track, for example. And, and Chair, Chair Nelson, we do have Tim McCleary. He's our CFO. He's on the on, on the on the call as well. He can he can definitely uh, yes. help you with the numbers as well. Uh, Mr. Uh, McClarity, is that correct? Uh, do you have some uh, insight on this? And um, can you uh, answer a couple of these questions? Yeah, and uh, thank you everyone for having us today. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, you know, so to uh, to get to the point a little bit, um, the sports that generate the scholarship seating uh, donations, that th those donations are spread across all of our sports to fund the scholarship bill for all of our sports. Um, so, you know, every, every single one of those. Um, when it comes to the number of scholarships that we can provide, that's capped by the NCAA. Each sport has a maximum, maximum amount that can be provided. Um, so we do not lim currently limit any of our sports um, for the number of scholarships that they can provide. Uh, but by generating these funds and, and getting this exemption, that allows us to continue to fully fund the scholarship costs, you know, as scholarships continue to increase, um, that's an increasing cost for us as an athletic department uh, going forward. So, um, you know, so getting kind of back to the point, it's spread across all of the sports. Um, so hopefully that helps um, some, but I'm glad to, to clarify. Uh, thank you, Mr. McCleary. Um, we could take this offline, uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm not convinced uh, that just spreading that across the all the sports equals um, equality. Uh, and so maybe that's something we can take offline and discuss uh, further. Um, and then uh, my other question was uh, for Senator Chamberlain. Uh, so I understand that, uh, it does show that um, the U uh, n generated 11 million from the scholarship seating donations over the past, over the last school year. And so um, these are donations that are being made, $11 million uh, of donations going to this very worthy cause of, addition, of uh, scholarships, hopefully spread equally uh, amongst all of the, all of the sports. But um, so then what does this bill do in addition to what's already being done? And, 
and whom would it impact um, beyond, who else has seat license fees beyond the U of M? So most of the testimony was about our um, land grant university, our flagship university, um, but are there other uh, colleges and universities in this state that have seat license fees? Um, Madam Chair, members, the first, there's the, the bill applies to all colleges and universities in Minnesota. And I, at the second part of that is, do other colleges and universities in the state of Minnesota have uh, these, uh, these licensing sort of uh, the scholarship preference piece on there for certain events and certain sports that I do not know for sure. And again, maybe Mr. Lewis or Mr. McCleary can answer that, but it's for all colleges, universities in the state and whatever, whatever, if there's others that do it besides uh, Duluth and U, uh, U of M, I'm not sure. Oh, thank you, Senator Chamberlain. And my, uh, Mr. McCleary or Mr. Lewis, my question is specifically um, not about, you know, if they're offering scholarships right now, that's the second question. The first question is, um, would they be eligible to participate in this bill or do they currently have seat licensing fees? Do we know what other um, <laughs> higher education institutions in Minnesota have seat licensing fees? You know, I only know uh, for certain for um, for the Twin Cities campus in Duluth. Um, you know, it's, it's there's potential that you know St. Cloud and um, Minnesota State, where they have some you know high performing hockey programs, may may, but I I, I do not know that for sure. Um, you now, one of the other things, if I could point out, was that the um, this uh, the sales tax went into place only a couple years ago. So it had been a long-standing program that had not been taxed, and um, so basically, this is this <coughs> would be to to go back to how how it was before. So this essentially kind of resulted in a new, uh, you know, million-dollar expense for us that that in a challenge in, in funding scholarships and in funding our opportunities. So um, I, the other thing I just wanted to quickly point out is that. You know, as far as we know, we're the only um, major um, college athletic department across the country that, that pays sales tax on on scholarship seating donations. So, um, you know, there's about 65 schools in what are considered to be the Power Five uh, conferences, um, and there's quite a few other schools that are, um, you know, not Power Five, so to speak, that that also have these programs, and and we're just not aware of anyone else that has the uh, has a sales tax on these on these donations. Oh, thank you, uh, Mr. McCleary. That that's very helpful. Um, so I do remember the seat licenses when they came out. I think it uh, was along with the Viking Stadium uh, proposal back in I don't know if that was uh, 2011 or 12, perhaps. And so, um, are, did I understand correctly, Mr. McCleary, that uh, the U then has had a seat licensing program since maybe post uh, that era, but uh, at some point after the seat licensing uh, fees, they were taxed at a later date. Was there a, a change in the tax policy um, that we're trying to rectify here? Um, yeah, and, and so Heather Broniak with our tax office may be able to provide some some specific years. But uh, um, you know, I've been here around about four years, and and I know the U has had the scholarship seating tax for you know much longer than. Than ten years, and the change happened a couple years ago. But Heather, do you have anything to add to that? Yes, Madam Chair, uh, Ms. Brogniak, welcome to the committee. Thank you for uh, popping up. Sure, um, I, I'm Heather Brogniak. I'm an assistant tax director at the University of Minnesota Tax Management Office, and the this issue really rose arose in. Um, 2016, when the Department of Revenue issued a revenue notice, Revenue Notice 16-02, that interpreted um, these charges for the, the uh, right to buy tickets as a taxable sale on our part. And we had always looked at them as charitable contributions. Mm -hmm. um, part of the history with that that might be helpful is there, there was a provision in the Internal Revenue Code in, in Section 170L that provided that 
80% of the amount paid for the right to purchase tickets to collegiate athletic events was a charitable donation. So higher ed institutions typically structured these contributions um, as a separate amount paid for the right to buy these preferred seating location tickets. Um, and the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act eliminated that provision in, uh, well, effective January 1st of 2018. So that's kind of where we have this separate amount that's paid. Um, and the Department of Revenue, we met with the Department of Revenue after they issued that revenue notice and said, do you really mean that, you know, these scholarship seating donations are subject to tax? And they, they took some time to look at it. They reissued their revenue notice and they clearly said, yes, they are subject to tax. So we don't add tax on to those um, scholarship seating donations. We back into the tax. And on the Minneapolis campus, it's 11.025% rate. So for, for us, that's a million, you know, a million dollar plus, as, as Mr. McCleary said, cost to us. And that just lowers the amount that can be spent on scholarships because our net amount is mm -hmm. hit by that sales tax. Oh, thank you. That is incredibly helpful. That kind of gets to the heart of the issue here. And I do applaud the university for uh, its focus on um, our students and making sure that uh, those scholarships are available. So that does kind of get to the heart of the issue then. And then I want to know where the 11.1% comes from. Is that the uh, sales and use tax uh, in the in Minneapolis? Madam Chair? Yes. Um, that's a combined rate. 11.025% is the 6.5 state and the 0.375% um, uh, natural resource and arts fund, the 0.5% Minneapolis tax, 0.15% Hennepin County tax, 0.5% Hennepin County transit tax, and then the big 3% entertainment tax, Minneapolis entertainment tax. Oh my. Thank you. This is incredibly helpful. I can see Senator Chamberlain's ears getting red. All right. Uh, I, but I cannot tell you how helpful uh, your testimony has been in really trying to unravel this very worthy proposal. And then my last question, uh, Ms. Uh, Broniak, I hope I'm saying your name correctly. Uh, correct me if I'm not. Um, does the university have the option since this is being, since these wonderful uh, donations are being taxed, does the university have the option to uh, collect tax on those donations. Kind of sounds like an oxymoron, but uh, can you uh, kind of address that piece, please? Um, Madam Chair, I think our our position has always been, you. we can only expect so much of a contribution in order to, for the, to, get, to get the right to buy these tickets in the preferred area. And so if you added tax onto that, you basically would have to lower the amount that you're requiring someone to make for the donation. And, and Mr. McCleary, you can add to that if you have some thoughts. Thank you, Ms. Broniak. Mr. <laughs> McCleary, any further uh, thoughts on that? Um, no. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, any other members? I, I don't see any hands up, any further? Senator Dietzik, I think has a question. Oh, Senator Dietzik, sure. thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this might be for council. Does the Vikings have this right to buy ticket tax? And is that something that they're allowed to do? And do they have that? And I'm assuming, it, I don't know if we know where that money goes to. Ms. Pollack, that might be coming to you. Um, Madam Chair, Senator Dietzik, um, yes, <clears throat> excuse me. It's it's not in, um, quite parallel because um, I think the, the focus here is on um, ensuring that the um, the proceeds from the sale go to scholarships, and that wouldn't really be applicable with the with the Viking Stadium. But there was some similar clarification, um, um, or I'm sorry, there's there was some guidance issued by the Department of Revenue around um, suite licenses and stadium builders licenses, um, and uh, kind of similar questions were raised about whether um, you know the right to purchase these things were subject to the. Um, you know, total sale or, or retail sale price of, of those seats. And so we enacted legislation a few years ago to, to clarify that. Um, and so there are um, exemptions for these things under certain conditions, um, like would be proposed here. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator Dietzik. 
uh, Ms. Pollock. Um, any further questions, members? Any further comments? Well, thank you very much. Uh, Senator Chamberlain, any closing comments? Um, Madam Chair, members, thank you for the time and consideration. Thank you to the testifiers for helping clarify some other things. Um, so uh, uh, we hope uh, we can get in. So thank you very much for the time and, and help support. Thank you, Senator Chamberlain. Uh, the bill will be laid over for possible inclusion. Next on our agenda, members, <laughs> is Senate File 448. Uh, Senator Bach moves Senate File 448. Uh, Senator Tomasoni, uh, welcome to the committee to your bill. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Good morning, members. Um, thank you for hearing this bill. Members, Senate File 448 is, a, is an authorization of a half cent local sales tax for the city of Floodwood. Uh, it would pay uh, up to 1.25 million in costs of a bond for the city of Floodwood for an infrastructure project for their streets. Floodwood is a small town of about 500 people in my Senate district. It's at the intersection of Highway 73 and Highway 2, both of them are state highways. And it's a very busy intersection, so they get a real lot of traffic coming through there. And um, and so they're, they're, they are small towns, so they, they don't have much uh, tax capacity to raise for such a project on their own. And uh, but they do get a real lot of visitors coming through and a real lot of traffic. The um, bill itself is uh, a, a subject of voter approval at a general election, and the tax would terminate uh, at the earlier of 25 years or when the city determines that they've had enough revenue to pay off the bond. And um, it's, uh, I, I, have, I have with me uh, the mayor and former police chief of about 30, 30 years, Dave Denoyer here. And you have in your packet also the um, a resolution from the city council uh, supporting supporting this uh, this particular bill, Madam Chair. So um, I can give you more information, but I think the mayor is probably better suited to do so, Madam Chair. So I'll turn it over to Mayor Denoyer. Uh, thank you, Senator or Senator Tomasoni. Mayor, welcome to the committee. Uh, please introduce yourself for the record and continue with your testimony. Thank you. Uh, Chair Nelson and the kind words, Senator Tomasoni and committee members. Uh, my name is Dave DeNoyer. I'm the uh, mayor of Floodwood. And the city of Floodwood is requesting authorization for a half cent sales tax. And the proceeds of the tax would be used for citywide infrastructure. The existing streets and underlying infrastructure are old, dilapidated, and outlived their useful life. This project is the number one priority for the city of Floodwood. It is estimated that the proceeds from the sales tax to the city would leverage uh, additional local, state, and federal funds. I do understand that using local sales tax uh, may not uh, uh, understand that using the local sales tax to pay for infrastructure is not standard practice. But Floodwood is needs in our surrounding, uh, other than our surrounding communities uh, throughout the state, do not have. For instance, medium household income is $33,274, whereas St. Louis County's is 53344 and the state medium household income is 74593 We're centrally located between Duluth, Hermantown, Proctor, Cloquet, Grand Rapids, Hibbing, Virginia. So we're about 35, 40 miles from each major community with no community to share parish services with. And due to our geographic location, but it serves as a hub with two major highways, one being US Highway 2 and the other State Highway 73, which is a gateway to the Iron Range, Northeast Minnesota. We serve as a regional hub for DNR, MnDOT Truck Station, St. Louis County Public Works, Arrowhead Transit. For a loan to show our the geographic area that we serve, our ambulance district covers 320 square miles. Our fire department serves 288 square miles. Our school district serves 317 square miles. 
Floodwood Services Training, which is helps people with struggling with mental uh, illness challenges, they can get a 40 mile square radius of Floodwood. And we're also home to medical and dental clinics that serve underserved patients in Northeast Minnesota. Currently, all the cities around Floodwood have sales tax. These committees, uh, communities are Hermantown, Proctor, Duluth, Cloquet, Scanlon, Virginia, and our neighbors of the West Grand Rapids has a bill in to do theirs this year. Um, and without us being able to put this to the voters, this puts our community at a disadvantage and, and uh, it, it allows other cur uh, uh, neighboring communities to, to uh, prosper why why we would not have the uh, the Mayor, economic uh, financial me. obligation to, to uh, uh, support our needs uh, mr mayor so we ask that you allow uh, us to take this bill for our voters um and uh obviously we thank you for your consideration this matter uh, Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I'm so sorry we were missing a few yes, of your comments uh, due to the delay in the bandwidth, but I, I believe we got we got most of those comments. Thank you very much. And maybe uh, having some computer problems here. Yes, I think it might help if you turn off your uh, camera. As much as we like to see you, we definitely need to hear your words, and that might help. Uh, so thank thank you, Mayor. Um, Madam thank Chair. you. Yes, and just you've answered most of the How's questions that? that we have regarding uh, sales tax uh, authorization. I just have uh, one more. You mentioned the regional significance of this uh, of this uh, sales tax. Um, well, I guess there's two questions that I don't know that I got an answer to. Um, one is. Uh, is any uh, would any of these funds collected through this uh, local sales tax be used for operations? Uh, Mr. Madam Chair, can you, can you hear me okay now? Yes, we can. Okay, is, none of it is for uh, city operations. It would all be used for infrastructure. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, exactly uh, what what we needed to hear. And then uh, the the final question um, is. Uh, do you feel that um, you will have enough revenue to service the debt uh, undertaken for this uh, infrastructure project? Uh, Madam Chair, that's a good question. Uh, we feel because this would, would be an authorization over, uh, I believe, 25 years, we feel there is enough to, uh, to uh, pay the debt. Um, but this, uh, you know, small cities, uh, this funding would allow us to leverage uh, additional funds, for instance, from the USDA, from the Community Development Block Grant Program, and other federal grant grants. Yes, I can understand that. Um, I don't know if those would help pay the debt service, however, on this particular uh, bond project, which would be one point one point two five million dollar uh, project. Um, Mr. Mayor, thank you very much uh, for your testimony. Uh, members, are there any further questions uh, by for the committee? I'm not seeing any hands. So, uh, Senator Tomasoni, uh, thank you for bringing this forward today. I do apologize. It got missed on our day where we heard 19 uh, sales tax and use proposals. And uh, for the mayor, uh, those three questions are really, uh, that's kind of the structure that we look for in the tax committee. Uh, is it used for operations? Um, is there enough, is it of regional significance? And will there be enough revenues to pay for the debt service on the bonds. After that, uh, really, uh, you know, we kind of leave that up to you and uh, to uh, convince your constituents that they should raise their sales tax for the, these particular projects. And so, uh, Mr. Mayor, you've answered all those questions. Uh, Senator Tomasoni, do you have any further comments? Uh, 
Yeah, Madam, Madam Chair, I, I think um, when when the mayor was pointing out that there's some potential grants that they may be able to access, yeah, it would it would reduce the the cost of the bond up front. I think is what he was pointing out, and and so that would make the bond more affordable. But uh, also because of uh, you can see he needs better internet out there. Also, I was so going to say you should add a broadband uh, project amendment into this, uh, Senator Tomazzoni. You might, Madam Chair. And um, so I have uh, I have uh, uh, a script that is similar to uh, the mayor's testimony. So I I will submit it to you, Madam Chair, so that you if you didn't hear everything he said, uh, you can see it on paper. So. Thank, Thank you, you Senator Thomasoni, for the hearing, and I appreciate your time. Thank you, Senator Thomasoni. Uh, the bill will be laid over for possible inclusion. Um, Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, the next bill on the agenda, members, is Senate File 2206. This is a Senator Frentz bill, and I believe Senator Rest is a co-sponsor on this bill. Senator Rest, uh, I mean, Senator Frentz, welcome to the committee. Uh, please explain your bill, Senate File 2026. Uh, first, telling me if you have any amendments. Thank you, Madam Chair. I do not have any amendments, but I'm very glad to present Senate File 2026. All right, Senator Frentz, to your bill. Well, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Members, this is a bill that creates a temporary income or corporate franchise tax credit based on the purchase and installation of solar energy systems. It's limited to the tax years 2021 to 2023. If you do not remember anything else I say about this bill, please remember this. Some Minnesotans in XL Energy or Minnesota Power Service territories have these solar programs. XL Energy offers solar rewards. Minnesota Power offers solar sense. These are great programs that provide these types of incentives to Minnesotans who wanna put a solar array on their home or farm or business. But some Minnesotans do not. And what Senate file 2026 would do is make this credit available, again, temporarily to all Minnesotans so that when it is a cost effective move for a home or business, this temporary tax credit can be provided. A couple of the things worth mentioning, of course, is that the fastest growing job sector in Minnesota is a solar technician. Iowa has a similar program to what I'm proposing here, Madam Chair, and they have generated hundreds of millions of dollars in economic activity. So I'm presenting this to you as a way to bring some ability for all Minnesotans, regardless of their utility service territory, to access solar energy and be a part of it. But I'm also selling this to you as a jobs and economic development bill. This will create revenue for these communities, for these states. Just one example would be a farmer places a solar array on his land. That creates a tax benefit to that county. That creates a benefit to all of us in Minnesota. Uh, we, we are also talking, obviously, Madam Chair and members, about our need to decarbonize. We set bipartisan goals for decarbonization in the year 2007, led by then Governor Pawlenty. We're simply not close to meeting those goals. So on the basis of our need to decarbonize, which solar energy will help us do, on the basis of the creation of jobs, and on the basis of some geographic equity, let's let everybody participate. I'm asking you to consider including this in your tax omnibus bill. To that end, in your packet, you will see a letter from Mencia. That's the solar energy developers. They are obviously strongly in support. I've also uh, asked Griffin Dooling from Blue Horizon Energy to give some very brief testimony, Madam Chair, and I hope you're uh, okay with that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Friends. Um, to our testifier, I'm sorry I didn't catch the name. Uh, it wasn't on my agenda, but welcome to the committee. Uh, please introduce yourself for the record and begin your testimony. Thank you, Senator Friends. Thank you, uh, Chair Nelson. Uh, my name is Griffin Dooling. I'm the CEO of Blue Horizon Energy. We're based in Minnetonka, Minnesota, and we develop solar projects for commercial and industrial customers across the upper Midwest. And we also work with some national uh, accounts as well. Uh, I'm also the vice president of the Minnesota Solar Energy Industries Association. Uh, we represent 115 different organizations involved in all sizes and scales of development of solar across Minnesota. And as Senator Friends indicated, we're very proud uh, to be bringing a lot of jobs to the state and creating a lot of economic activity. Uh, this program and then this proposal for this tax credit really originates from 
the goal of creating a vehicle to Im improve the economic stimulus for Minnesota over the next several years as we rebuild from COVID. Uh, this is an industry that's been very successful in the, uh, in the state thus far, and we see this as a path to continue expanding the benefits of solar uh, across the state and especially improving access in areas of rural Minnesota where a lot of these programs that Senator Friends mentioned uh, just don't exist because of the nature of the utilities there. Uh, and ultimately, when we look at these projects, there's a strong benefit for homeowners, farms, and, and small businesses, which are the target markets for this particular uh, program. This is not targeted towards large-scale development. This is not targeted towards large corporate projects. This really is small and mid-sized businesses, farms, and homes, exactly the type of people that we want to support. And when we look at the benefit for them, there's obviously the sustainability aspect of, of bringing a sustainable uh, energy source into uh, the business model for uh, these businesses. But then there's also the element of financial resilience, where the average uh, project that we do for a farm, for example, in rural Minnesota, will save anywhere from eight dollars to $12,000 of energy expense uh, per year from that project. And so you look at that, it's not an enormous amount of money in the, in, uh, in, in the grand scheme of a, of a state budget. For, for an individual farm, you know, that annual energy savings makes a very significant difference. Uh, the other thing that this program is, is inspired by is really the success that's been seen in our neighboring state in Iowa. And Iowa is obviously a market where uh, it has a much bigger rural uh, population than Minnesota uh, as far as the, the demographics go. And this program has been very successful there in leveling the playing field and, and helping to deploy solar more broadly beyond the cities uh, and, and beyond the large investor-owned utilities in Iowa. Ultimately, as Senator Friends mentioned, uh, the program in Iowa over the last 10 years has generated a little over $300 million in economic activity. And in order to generate that, they awarded uh, about $36 million in tax credits through a very similar program to what we're describing here. Uh, the one modification that's been made in this particular context in trying to uh, bring this program to Minnesota is that we've targeted on rural areas. In Iowa, it's open to anybody. So here we're targeting to rural areas because we do have these uh, programs that benefit uh, you know, our urban communities so significantly. And then also uh, we focused it on, the, on sort of the small and, and mid-sized projects where we think this can make a real difference to individual businesses. Uh, so I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, we really appreciate the time and, and the members' consideration here on the bill uh, and, uh, and thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dooling. Um, yes, well, we do know how important uh, solar is. We've seen great impacts, great strides, great growth in the solar industry. And um, I, I have a sense that with the more recent storage developments, we're going to see even more growth uh, in this industry. My question for you, Senator Friends, is why are some, why, why is there in, this inequity now? Why are some Minnesotans uh, being served by utilities that are offering this, these type of credits and other utilities are not offering these type of credits? And why is it that they need a tax uh, boost from the state to do that? I just wanna know why is there this difference in utilities offering uh, this type of incentive uh, for solar? Thank you, Madam Senator. Chair. I could not have scripted a better question. Uh, the answer is because of the economies of scale for XL Energy and Minnesota Power, they have an easier time putting these programs together. That's great for those of us who live in XL or Minnesota Power territories, but other utilities, largely due to the size of those utilities, have not been able to put together these programs, at, at least not yet. And that is why in the state of Iowa, they just said, we're going to do the whole show. As Mr. Dooling pointed out, the primary beneficiaries of this bill would be in rural Minnesota, and for a variety of reasons but largely having to do with economies of scale, the utilities that serve those Minnesotans have simply not put these programs together yet. They have their own bottom lines to worry about, and I don't begrudge them that. And I, um, I think this is a way for us to do what Iowa did, which is, as you can see in the bill, there's a cap of $5 million. So Iowa was able to translate 36 million of credits into over 300 million of economic benefit. Madam Chair, I hope we can do the same thing uh, regardless of where the Minnesotans live. Thank you, uh, Senator Friends. Uh, uh, members, any comments? I know we're running tight on time here. Uh, any further comments, members? I'm not seeing any. Uh, in, do you have any final comments, Senator Friends? 
No, but just appreciate very much the time, Madam Chair. Also, Ms. Pollock's put out a brief which has more specifics, if any members want those specifics, about the percentage of the credit and the limits to it in the brief. And with that, I yes. know you're very busy. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair and members. Thank you, Senator Friends. I believe those are uh, on your documents, uh, members linked on the uh, calendar page. Uh, thank you, Senator Friends. Um, the next um, item on our agenda is uh, Senator Weber, and this is file 918, home tax credit for ethanol retailers. Uh, Senator, um, Senator Miller moves Senator Weber's bill, Senate file 918. Uh, Senator Weber, to your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I do have the A1 amendment. Uh, thank you. Uh, members, I'm, can you pull up the A1 amendment? And um, it is on your digital links. Um, and Senator Weber, uh, to the A1 amendment, if you can just briefly describe that, then we will adopt your amendment. It's a very, uh, very simple amendment, Madam Chair. It basically, uh, I, the bill started out with a five-year credit, and this uh, amendment extends it to a 10-year credit. All right. Uh, the um, Senator Bach moves the Weber A1 amendment. Uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Show your camera, please. Aye. aye. Opposed? Seeing none, uh, the amendment is adopted. Senator Weber, the bill is in the shape you desire. Uh, to your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, basically, uh, this bill is designed to provide assistance to our service station operators, and particularly our smaller operators, uh, as they look at trying to retool for E15 uh, ethanol blends and higher. Uh, ethanol uh, blended gasoline has proven its worth in terms of uh, its uh, ability to burn more efficiently and cleaner. And uh, But as we go forward, um, without, uh, without same as uh, legislation and the part of the MPCA and what have you, uh, it becomes important for our service station operators to uh, be able to retool their, their pumps and their tanks in order to comply uh, with the requirements uh, put out by the federal government and the state MPCA. Uh, this, uh, this bill would provide a credit of five cents per gallon uh, that would uh, go to the service station operator. And uh, while there is some money that's being talked about in terms of helping provide infrastructure, uh, that amount of money that has been talked about is extremely uh, inadequate to cover the needs of our service station operators across Minnesota. And so uh, with that, um, uh, Madam Chair, I would uh, uh, turn the testifiers table over to uh, Mr. Klott uh, uh, first, uh, who represents Minnesota Service Stations. Uh, thank you, Senator Weber. Uh, Mr. Klott, welcome to the committee. Introduce yourself and proceed with your testimony. I would note that we are running a few minutes behind. We do wanna hear uh, all of your comments, uh, however. So uh, Mr. Klott. Yes, uh, good morning, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Lance Klatt, Executive Director of the Minnesota Service Station and Community Store Association, representing nearly 400 independent petroleum auto repair operators in Minnesota, and Executive Director of the Minnesota Independent Oil Company, also known as Minoco, uh, which we have 40 local fueling sites. Both organizations I represent support Senate File 918 Minoco locations were the first in the country to adopt E15 as a group in 2013, understanding the cost of the infrastructure and the cost of educating our local communities about E15. Cost of infrastructure can vary by each project. On average, a retail fueling facility may spend anywhere from $200,000 to $300,000 for an infrastructure comprising of underwriter laboratories approved dispensers, piping, sump pumps, and other costs meeting the EPA or the MPCA's regulatory approval. As Minnesota retailers continue their quest of offering additional ethanol fuels, Infrastructure costs keep most retailers from entering the game along with education and marketing costs promoting E15 at the retail level. My two organizations applaud the opportunity for a five cent per gallon tax credit for every gallon sold of E15 and additional ethanol products such as E30 and E85. E15 and other ethanol fuels are great fuels. E15 in the Minocle stores represents 30% of our overall fuel volume, so consumers do like the product as E85 and E30 represent nearly 10% of our overall fuel volume while supporting our local communities and our local farming economy. The ethanol tax credit supports more infrastructure, more sales of ethanol, more jobs and more opportunities Minoco's mission statement can attest, homegrown fuels from your hometown retailers can also be accepted by all Minnesota retailers with this. 
want to thank Senator Weber and committee members for adding the amendment, allowing Minnesota retailers more time as an incentive and an opportunity helping them recover the cost of installing new infrastructures, additional expenses of education, and marketing of E15, E30, and E85. Again, thank you for the opportunity and testifying this morning, and I'm available for any questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Klatt. Uh, stay tuned. You may have a few questions. Uh, your next testifier, uh, Senator Weber, uh, Tim Weibel. Correct. Mr. Weibel, welcome to the committee. Introduce yourself for the record, please, and begin your testimony. Good, mor good, good morning, Madam Chair and committee members. My name is Tim Weibel. I currently serve as president of the Minnesota Corn Growers Association. I farm down by Cortland, Minnesota with my wife and two sons. We grow corn, soybeans, and race hogs. On behalf of the Minnesota Corn Growers 6,500 members, I would like to speak in support of Senate File 918. And thank you for Senator Weber for bringing this forward. The key policy priority of Minnesota Corn Growers is to expand access and use higher ethanol blends to improve air quality and reduce carbon emissions while giving engines a higher octane at a lower price. Our association has worked for several years with fuel retailers to expand access to higher blends of ethanol through infrastructure programs and ethanol promotion such as to customers as well as the public policy. Expanded retail access for higher blends of ethanol value adds value to nearly 1.2 billion gallons of ethanol we already produce in Minnesota and adds value to the corn grown by Minnesota farm families. Minnesota leads the nation in the number of retail offering uh, higher blends of ethanol by having more than 380 fueling stations offering E15 or E88. However, with nearly 3,600 fuel retail locations, there is plenty of room for growth. Minnesota has a history of providing grants to retailers to replace or upgrade infrastructure for higher blends. We appreciate that Senate File 918 offers a different approach by offering fuel retailers a refundable tax credit for ethanol blends that are at least 15% but no more than 85%. Senate file 918 is another way to allow retailers who want to sell higher blends of ethanol, but are concerned about some of the upfront costs to make the upgrades and begin selling higher octane cleaner burning fuel. By having multiple avenues to provide an incentive for retailers to replace or upgrade equipment uh, by for selling higher blends of ethanol to their consumers. We we would, we can continue to lead the way in higher blends of ethanols to, for the benefit of our consumers, the environment, and the economy. Thank you for this opportunity to speak on Senate File 918. Uh, thank you, Mr. Weibel. Um, Senator Weber, I just have a, a couple questions that you might be able to answer, or perhaps they're questions for staff. Um, I noticed that um, it's a credit equal to $0.10 cents, uh, per gallon that is sold at the stations, I, I believe. And there's about 950 taxpayers that would be eligible for this credit. And the annual impact uh, fiscal uh, revenue estimate would be 2.8 million beginning in 22, growing to 5 million in 2025. Um, but I'm not sure that these estimates uh, reflect the A1 amendment. Madam Chair. Senator Weber. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think first maybe what we need is an explanation. Uh, the bill calls for a five cent and the the discussion for the Department of Revenue talks about a 10 cent. And so I think maybe we need some clarification as to the numbers that were used there. Thank you, uh, Senator Weber. Madam yes. Chair. Uh, who would be speaking? I didn't Mr. see. Uh, Mr. Wilms, just the person we need to hear from. <laughs> Madam Chair and committee members, uh, I apologize. The uh, revenue estimate is actually scored to a five cent per uh, gallon credit, um, which is consistent with the bill and the A1. Um, it, it, it's actually just a typo in the revenue estimate. So I've uh, asked UR to republish, but the numbers are, are accurate to the bill as under discussion. Oh, thank you, Mr. Wilms. So the numbers are accurate per the amendment and is it accurate that um, 950 taxpayers would benefit? That's correct, uh, Madam Chair and committee members. I, I'm not aware of any other issues where their revenue estimate is an error. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Wilms. Uh, any further comments? Seeing none, final comments, uh, Senator Weber. 
Thank you. Oh, Senator, Senator Rest has here. is waving her oh, hand there. Senator Rest, I'm sorry, I can't see your hand. Senator Rest. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, uh, Senator Weber, I was curious about why um, this is going to individuals, um, taxpayers, and why you chose to make it a refundable credit rather than um, a non-refundable credit so that it would be able to bring their uh, <clears throat> tax liability down to zero, but not, um, but not below that. Is it the case that these uh, 950 um, um, gas stations and sellers are, um, most of them are currently showing um, um, uh, no income at all, um, uh, or they're not paying any, any taxes um, uh, that would that would make the if it was non-refundable, just as a suggestion, it would make it available um, to um, to all the stations down to a zero uh, tax liability, and would make um, the credit. I would assume, and Mr. Wilms can uh, correct me, uh, make make the credit not on. Um, not even cost as much as this, and and still bring a great deal of benefit for those gas stations that are indeed um, um, showing just a bit of income. It would reduce their liability to zero. Uh, and then uh, separately, uh, Madam Chair, we had a question about whether we have properly dealt with the Senator Friends bill in terms of moving it and laying it over. We can deal with that later, but we appreciate your attention. But my question yes. is to uh, Senator Weber. Senator Weber. Just thank, thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Rest. Um, you know, at, at this point, <clears throat> excuse me, um, as, we, as we look at uh, this uh, scenario, um, I think uh, there is uh, probably a merit uh, in terms of making it refundable. Uh, Mr. Wilms, would you like to comment as to, mm. as to that issue? Mr. Wilms. Madam Chair and, and Senator Weber, um, I, I would comment to the extent that I'd say that uh, I think Senator Ress is correct that if this were to be made uh, non-refundable, then the amount would decrease, likely decrease. Um, the amount by which it would decrease, I couldn't speak to. It would depend on the underlying uh, position of those taxpayers. Um, but if that's in the interest of members, we could certainly request that uh, you know to be rescored based on that. Senator Weber. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I think, you know, I, I think it bears uh, further evaluation. Um, right now, uh, this, uh, this legislation has been patterned after what is taking place in a number of other states uh, where it has proven to be successful. And I think uh, before we would make any change here, I would like to uh, explore that issue further. Thank you, Senator Weber. We'll look for that update, to Mr. Wilms, if we can uh, get that out. Uh, to the committee. Um, any other final, uh, Senator Rust has a question. Oh, thank you, well, I, I appreciate um, <clears throat> uh, Senator Weber's um, um, interest in, in pursuing the, the difference between the two and getting the policy in place of providing this credit um, at, um, and maybe at a cost that makes it even more attractive to be included in the in the final bill. So ju just a suggestion to get the policy of a um, of this kind of credit on on the table and looking at the difference between the two and and then um, deciding um, um, you as the chief author deciding w which one to um, pursue. I, I support it. I just um, sometimes you just have to get your foot in the door, and uh, and then maybe if there's a little bit of extra room later, it can go back to the other way. So just just a suggestion, friendly one. Thank, Thank you, you Senator Rice. Yeah, the voice of experience. Uh, many many uh, many challenging budgets. Too much good stuff, not quite enough uh, room always right away. Um, Senator Weber, any final comments? Uh, Senator Klein has his hand up. Yep. Madam Chair. Senator Klein. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Weber. Uh, actually, I have a follow-up to your original question, Senator 
Nelson, um, uh, for Mr. Wilms. Uh, so you mentioned that there was a typo between the 10 cents and the 5 cents and that the revenue estimate is accurate to the underlying bill. Are you also saying that the revenue estimate is accurate to the A1 amendment? Because that doesn't seem to be the case to me. Mr. Wilms. Y yes, committee members, the, the A1 amendment, um, as far as I'm aware, just uh, you know extends the date by which the carryover exists. Um, and so it, the, the, the bill language is still the five cents per gallon. Uh, uh, you know, so the, the amendment um, affects the carryover, which is captured within the revenue estimate, but um, the, the revenue estimate is an error uh, based on, uh, it is basically uh, the, the revenue estimate uh, is accurate to the five cents uh, per gallon. The, so the, it, it, the A1 is extending the carryover period outside of the sort of planning horizon and uh, from five years to 10 years. So that's the only difference so um, we'll get further uh, confirmation on this as well as an uh, updated revenue estimate comes in. We'd like it to include the amendment and the accurate uh, credit of five cents per gallon. I think that will answer our questions, uh, Mr. Uh, Senator Klein, as we get that. Uh, members, I'm so sorry. I cannot see all of the hands. Are there any others? I am not seeing any. Uh, and so, uh, Senator Weber, any final comments? Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you to my testifiers and to the members who have brought up uh, some good points. And um, we will uh, uh, we will conti continue to work on this and uh, fairly quickly and uh, and uh, get the, the information to you. I believe this is really important as we look at the future of the ethanol industry and. Uh, and the, uh, the clean energy that it provides. And so thank you for giving this bill a hearing, Madam Chair, and um, we will proceed from here. Thank you, um, Senator Weber. Uh, Senate file 918 as amended will be laid over for possible inclusion. And uh, just to be clear, uh, as is uh, Senator Friends bill 2026 uh, is laid over for possible inclusion. Uh, I believe I mentioned at the beginning of the hearing that is the intention that all of these bills uh, will be laid over for possible inclusion uh, in the omnibus bill. Uh, Senator Madam, Bach. Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Wilms. I apologize. I just want to say one more thing. Um, when I when I said carryover, I meant sunset. The um, the bill language, uh, the amendment uh, extended the sunset of the provision, not the carryover. So I apologize for being unclear about that. But um, just wanted to make sure that members were aware that um, that the revenue estimate captures the extension of the sunset period as well. Oh, thank you, uh, Mr. Wilms. That is very clear. All right, um, Senator Bach. Uh, Senate file 1102, would you please move your bill and do you have any amendments? Uh, Madam Chair, I move uh, Senate file 1102 be re recommended to pass. No, I don't have any amendments, Madam Chair. <clears throat> oh, thank you, uh, Senator Bach. Um, the intention would be to lay it over for possible inclusion. Is that uh, uh, your motion? Uh, well, I, I, think, I think Madam Chair it probably needs to go to rules. I think oh, yes, need... it does. We either should send this to rules because it, it appoints legislators or your entire tax bill is going to end up in rules. So I think uh, oh, yes. this, this is also would be easier. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, also a voice of reason there. I forgot. And actually, it needs to go to state government. So uh, the motion will be uh, you've moved your bill and you'll re refer it to go to state government when we finish here. So, uh, Senator Bach, uh, to your bill, please. I think what will happen. Senate file 1102. I think what will happen, Madam Chair, when the when the front desk gets the committee report from this committee, it'll automatically go to rules because of the committee deadlines. So, uh, but ultimately, they can send it back to state government. Thank you so much. Well, Madam Chair, <clears throat> I I started looking at this yesterday afternoon and to figure out where I should start talking about this, and uh, I kind of concluded this probably needs a, a, a whole day's conversation down in room 15, where we're all in the same room. But uh, the short of it is, you know, back in 1983, uh, the legislature put a provision in law that required the Department of uh, Revenue to every two years submit to the legislature a tax expenditure budget, just like the appropriation budget we pass to submit to the legislature a budget of tax expenditures. 
what things are not taxed because the legislature exempted them essentially. And that's a couple hundred pages. It's if 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 you like taxes, it's very interesting reading. Uh, I did include it in the committee packet, and after I did that, I thought, boy, that's maybe not what I should have included. What I probably should have included was in the 2010 uh, tax bill. Uh, there was a provision in there, and uh, council uh, was able to find the report. But in the 2010 tax bill, and I'll just read out of the summary of it, the 2000 tax bill put this language in it. It said, by February 15th, 2011, the Commissioner of Revenue shall provide a report to the chairs of and ranking minority members of the House and the Senate with jurisdiction over taxes, a process for periodic review sunset or extension of tax expenditures on an ongoing basis. So interestingly, back in 2010, the legislature made a decision that we should be have some kind of a process in place where we review these tax expenditures. And a whole point, we heard a whole bunch more of them today. And, and fortunately, some of them came with sunset, so they will be automatically revisited, uh, but most do not. So, uh, what I think what ended up happening was uh, in 2010, the majority in the legislature switched and we got a new tax chair. We were facing a $6 billion deficit in 2011. And I'm, I guess I'm not even sure that this report was ever reviewed by the legislature, but it's very interesting. And I should, I should really maybe send it out to everybody. It does recommend creating a commission. It's about a 50-page report from the Department of Revenue. It recommends, uh, and the bill that you have in front of you really mirrors the recommendations of this 2011 report that the legislature asked for to create a commission to start to review these tax expenditures. The bill says that every 10 years, every tax expenditure should be reviewed. Uh, it appoints uh, two members of the Senate uh, from and two members of the House, and then the Department of Revenue Commissioner or his designee to select groups of tax expenditures that they're going to review and then submit a report on those tax expenditures relative to are they uh, meeting, do they have a purpose? And you know, some in law don't actually have a purpose. Uh, are they meeting, what are the objectives and are they meeting them? And I, I think, uh, that's really, really important because when I was reviewing this report, I came across something because one thing in the tax expenditure budget that's not there is how much do all these tax expenditures give up in revenue? And there's not a total in there. But in reviewing this report, uh, it said that the, the income tax portion of the tax expenditure report is actually the, the, the amount of income exempted from taxes is about half of what we actually collect. So that's a significant amount of money. And on the sales tax portion of the tax expenditure budget, what the report from the department says is the amount of sales tax not collected because we exempted it is a larger number than what we actually collect. So, you know, that's all spending uh, because we're not getting the revenue. So. I just think uh, now and going forward and in recent years, we've talked about sunsets on things. And, and you know, the only thing I can ever remember us actually sunsetting on a tax expenditure was in 2010 uh, when we passed the historic building tax credit, the angel tax credit, and added some money to the research and development credit. Because we didn't have any money around that year, we had to figure out how to pay for it. Uh, but we did, and, and what we did in 2010 was back in 2008 when the gas tax was passed, in order for the House to get the votes, to get the, the that eight cent gas tax passed, eight and a half cents that was passed, uh, there were a couple House members, one or more, that insisted that low-income people were going to be impacted by this gas tax. So they put a $25 annual tax credit on everybody in the state. So everybody got 25 bucks back from the general fund to offset the cost of the of the gas tax increase. And you know, you didn't even have to own a car 
and, and you got you got the money back. It was pretty poorly crafted. It was done in the House. Uh, we actually repealed it in 2010. It raised about $30 million by repealing it. And that's what we paid for the historic building tax credit and the angel credit and the additional money for the research and development credit back in 2010. But it's the only one I can think of that we've ever actually repealed that was passed uh, into law. Uh, and this isn't to say that this commission's going to, and it allows in the bill language the commission to not have to review ones that are issues of federal conformity. So if, if we're, and many of these tax expenditures are put in as a condition of, of federal tax conformity, things like, for example, the mortgage interest deduction, that's a federal conformity issue. Uh, so it allows the commission to not, to make a decision to not review those kind of things that are federal conformity provisions, which I think is kind of important. Uh, but Madam Chair, that's kind of the, the, the scope of all of it. Uh, I, there, there's not enough time to have a good thorough conversation about it, but I will uh, send to maybe to your office this report that was done by the department that the 2010 tax bill asked for, because uh, it is pretty interesting to read. This is an issue that's been around this committee as long as I've been around. And, and we've never really tackled it. We keep talking about it. We've started to put sunsets on in a, in a you know, in a way to recognize the fact that, gee, these need a little bit more scrutiny. But, you know, unlike appropriations in the budget that, uh, you know, every two years have to be uh, looked at and scrutinized, these tax expenditures, I mean, for the most part, the very, very most part, never get looked at again. So, uh, and, and uh, you look at a lot of them in there when you look through that 200 page document and you kind of ask yourself, well, you know, that's kind of a nice idea. But uh, is, is it really getting uh, getting to the purpose? You know, these are all taxpayer dollars that are that are going to all of these things. So, Madam Chair, I, I appreciate the committee's consideration. Uh, I would encourage everybody to take a good look at the at this uh, report that the department did. I'll, I'll, I'll send it to your office. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator Bach. Uh, we will have more discussion on this. I see uh, you have a nice broad group of co-sponsors on this committee, Senator Chamberlain, myself, Senator Dietzik, and you have Senator Pratt. So you have a lot of folks who are interested in this that are uh, have been involved in the tax committees. So uh, this bill uh, will be laid over for- Madam possible. Chair, uh, Senator Rest has a question. I'll be very brief. Senator Rest. I'll be very brief, thank you. Um, one of the uh, uh, flaws in um, that we've discovered over the years in um, setting up legislative commissions is that it, Senator Bach, and I know you're aware of this, that a, uh, a report is required, a report is issued, and it sits on the shelf. It might get a hearing, but it sits on the shelf. And I would suggest as we go forward that you add that the commission is required to submit um, legis uh, uh, legislation that reflects their report so that bills are introduced and they're given formal hearings not just an informational hearing before the tax committees i think that focuses the work of a commission and um and it um uh, just sh sharpens the process thank you madam chair i thank you for those comments uh, senator rest uh, senate file senator bach final comments senator rest i think that's a that's a good suggestion this is a I think the reason this has never been done is it's just too much work. You know, it's just easier to give more exemptions and more exemptions and more exemptions and never go back and revisit it. This is this will be heavy lifting to the people that are on this commission. But when, when you look at the scope of how much stuff we're exempting and we add more pretty much every budget cycle, uh, it, it, you know, it, it just merits some periodic review. And Senator Rest, that's a good suggestion. Thank you, Senator Bach. Are those your final comments? Yes. Thank you, Senator Bach and Senator Rest. The bill will be laid over for possible inclusion. Uh, Senator, I think we got to move this bill. Madam oh, Chair. yes. Excuse me. I forgot uh, in my rush. Yes, this bill, uh, as amended, uh, will be re-referred to rules. Uh, ma Madam Chair, I think if it, it'll, need, it'll need to go to state government, and then they'll the desk will automatically send it. So I, I, Madam Chair, and maybe Ms. Paula can help me out here, but I think the motion should be to move this bill to state gov because it does create a commission 
And I think they should take a peek at it. And to Senator Box point, he's right. It'll probably get re-referred, but I think our motion should be to go to state gov. Thank you. Uh, Senator Bach, uh, would you like to re-refer your bill, please? Uh, Madam Chair, I'd I, I move that the bill be rec recommended to pass and re-refer to the rules of the uh, state government committee. Thank you. All those in favor, please turn on your cameras uh, and signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Seeing none, uh, the bill uh, will be uh, re-referred is recommended to pass and will be re-referred. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Bach. Um, next on our agenda, members, is Senate File 1708. Senator Coleman, uh, would you like to move your bill? Um, yes, Madam Chair. I would like to move, is, is it 1708? Yes. Uh, this is the repeal of the income tax add back for the K-12 tuition plan uh, distributions. Senator Coleman, member of this committee, uh, please uh, give us some uh, insight. Speak to your bill, please. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And I do have the A1 um, author's amendment. Oh, thank you, uh, Senator Coleman. Senator Coleman moves the A1 author's amendment. Um, can you briefly tell us what your amendment is? And we'll take a, a quick a vote on that. Absolutely. Um, the amendment addresses a small portion of the tax chapter in order to maintain the intent of the bill, uh, which is to remove all penalties on 529 distributions for K through 12 expenses. Thank you, uh, Senator Coleman. Um, with that, all in favor of Senator Coleman's author's amendment to A1, uh, turn on your cameras, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, seeing none. Uh, the A1 amendment is adopted. Uh, Senator Coleman, to your bill as amended. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, as I mentioned, this bill uh, is in regards to 529 accounts and K through 12 disbursements. It conforms to federal tax law on tax treatment of these accounts, um, which was first allowed as part of the 2017 Tax Credit and Jobs Act. Uh, federal law allows families to use their 529 accounts for K through 12 tuition and uh, the gain on the disbursement is not taxable income under federal law. Um, however, it is uh, taxable income under state law and Minnesota has not conformed yet to this federal provision. Uh, this bill would conform to federal tax law and reduce state taxes for families who use their 529 account uh, for K through 12 disbursements by not counting the gain as taxable income. Um, according to the IRS, one of the um, uh, TCJA changes allows distributions from 529 plans to be used to pay for up to a total of $10,000 of tuition per beneficiary um, each year at an elementary or secondary public, private, or religious school of the beneficiary's choosing. Uh, most people likely use it for private school tuition, but public school expenses are also eligible. Um, and this is really important during a year when many families had to make difficult decisions about what learning environment was best for their children during the pandemic and had unexpected uh, K through 12 education expenses as a result. Um, so with that, Madam Chair, I know this committee has uh, seen this proposal before. I think this is a great year to really address this and really appreciate you uh, letting me present my bill. Oh, thank you, uh, Senator Coleman. Um, do you have any testifiers, Senator Coleman? Uh, no, I do not. Well, you did a fine job of describing uh, the bill. Um, members, are there any uh, questions for Senator Coleman? I'm going to ask staff to let me know if they see any questions. I cannot see everyone or those hands. No questions, Senator. Uh, Thank you, um, Mr. Steinhoff. Uh, Senator Coleman, if you'd like to renew your motion that Senate File 1708 be amended to pass, or would, as amended, be um, laid over for possible inclusion. Yes, Madam Chair, I move that Senate File 1708 be laid over for possible inclusion as amended. Uh, thank you. Uh, great bill, Senator Coleman. Thank you so much. Um, our last bill, members, is Senate File 934, the Child Care Professional Tax Credit. That's my bill. So we're going to send this gavel here over to Senator Miller. All right. Uh, Senator Nelson, Senate File 934. Uh, please proceed. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And 
Members, thank you for your patience. We've had a long day, but Senate File 934 is a critically important bill. Um, at this time, particularly, it is the child care tax credit. And um, we are all aware, well aware, of the child care crisis in our districts and across our state. In fact, we were aware of this before the pandemic, which has only made this worse. Uh, there is no uh, one solution to this crisis, but we know that we must incentivize providers to enter and remain in the field. Um, we know that abysmal provider compensation is one piece of the puzzle. Child care faces the paradox of parents not being able to pay more, but providers not being able to be paid less. Child care is one of the lowest paid careers in the state of Minnesota. And Deed has pointed out that we uh, actually pay parking lot attendants more than we pay those educating and caring for our youngest children. And we know how critically important uh, these early years are. The bill before you seeks to encourage and reward both educational attainment among licensed child care providers and participation in our quality rating and improvement system. Uh, I do hope uh, you look at your handouts today. There are a number of them in support of this bill. As um, one of the handouts says from the National Committee for Economic Development, um, this bill is one way to bridge the gap between what parents can pay and what providers can make without passing the costs on to the families in the form of increased tuition. This bill tells, ties eligibility for credits to the parent aware, but it is important to note that the star level in parent aware has no bearing on the amount of the tax credit for the provider. Uh, that is tied to each individual's education level. And a provider need only hold a one-star rating to benefit fully from these credits. You'll want to know that the credits are tiered to educational attainment as follows. The Child Development Associate, which is a nationally recognized credential, uh, can be done online. Uh, the state does offer scholarships to subsidize the cost. Uh, it is not a college degree. That is a $1,000 uh, tax credit. An AA degree uh, provides a $2,500 uh, credit. And you would note that uh, this bill could work in tandem with the recent addition of AA degrees in the early childhood education that's made available through the Minnesota Workforce Development Scholarship uh, at, two, at our state two-year colleges. So good um, pairing there. And then finally, the highest level is a $3,000 credit, and that is for a Bachelor of Arts or higher degree. Uh, you will note these credits are refundable. I do believe this is a critical piece for those working in a low paid field such as this. Uh, this bill is modeled after those successfully implemented in Louisiana, South Carolina, Nebraska, and Colorado. I would say Minnesota still has time to be an early adopter. We have led on early childhood, early quality education issues for so long. And I would uh, direct your attention to the many letters of support for this approach uh, submitted by providers, business advocates, and more, uh, in addition to the handouts I mentioned from the National Committee on Economic Development. I have two, uh, three testifiers here today representing both family and center-based childcare in both the metro area and greater Minnesota. Um, and so, Mr. Chair, I'd like to um, have you bring up those testifiers, please. Uh, Senator Nelson, do you have uh, do you have an amendment uh, on the bill before we uh, bring up the testifiers? Uh, oh, yes, I do. Uh, thank you. I need to move the bill uh, and the amendment. Uh, let me find that amendment here. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, uh, members, the A1 amendment is a calendaring amendment. And so on page one, line 21, it deletes 2020 and inserts 2021. So uh, updating this bill for uh, these times now. 
So, um, members, okay. with that, I'd like to move the A1 amendment. Senator Nelson offers the A1 amendment. Um, on the amendment, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, aye. aye. Opposed say no. The motion prevails. The amendment is adopted. And next, uh, we will go to the testifiers. Uh, the first testifier I have on the list is Aisha Jackson. Uh, welcome to the committee. Uh, please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony if Aisha is with us. Yes, I'm here. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Uh, please state your name for the record and uh, proceed with uh, your testimony. Okay, so hello, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Aisha Jackson. I am a family child care provider in Minneapolis. I have been in child care for 10 years one year in my own program. My program serves 10 children and I am in the process of earning a parent aware rating. I am committed to serving children in my community from all backgrounds. I recently took a course on the effects of trauma in early childhood and it made me want to get involved in advocacy for our field. This is my second time advocating and I'm grateful for the invitation. So the tax credits created by this bill would be an immense help to me and so many other providers I've known and worked with in my career. Providers like me have not been valued as we should be. I care about quality and I am always open to learning more so that children and I serve the best, that I serve get the best possible start. I care about my own education and have earned an AA degree. But unlike in other fields, when you increase your qualifications in child care, there's often little to no opportunity for an increased compensation. Before joining Parent Aware, I had limited guidance on what it means to be a high quality program. Going through this program taught me how to positively interact with children and their families, set routines and develop lesson plans based on individual assessments of each child. There is a lack of high quality child care in North Minneapolis. And I believe that these funds would motivate current and future providers to further their education and improve their programs. I believe that children and adults thrive on affirmations and positive reinforcement. If providers are rewarded on furthering their education, they will, and in return, we would have more children that are academically and emotionally ready for kindergarten and the world beyond. Thank you, Miss Jackson, for your testimony, and thank you for uh, caring for the children that you care for. Uh, next on the list of testifiers, we have Karen DeVos. Uh, welcome to the committee. Uh, please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Karen DeVos, and I live in Ada, Minnesota. I have been serving children and families in greater Minnesota for the last 23 years as a respite care and emergency foster care provider, a 16 year family child care provider, and most recently as a child care center owner and preschool teacher. And it's worth being noted that I actually own the only child care center program in our entire county. While my roles within the early childhood field have evolved over the last 23 years, and the teacher and the care provider that I was when I started my family child care business in 1998 is far different than the one that I am today. One thing has remained steady. The early care and education workforce does not get the professional respect or financial reward that we deserve. Those working in early care and education, regardless of how care is provided, cannot afford to make less. We also know that parents cannot afford to pay more. We are at a crossroads in Minnesota, and I truly believe that this budget year has the potential to be the most exciting one we have seen to date for the early childhood field and the most important residents in our state, our children. This MCCA sponsored tax credit bill will provide clear incentives for quality, support continued education in the early childhood field, and encourage providers to help the children and families most in need. As a parent aware rated facility, I understand firsthand the difficulty that has come with implementing our state's quality rating system. I also understand that parent aware is far from perfect, but it has made incredible strides over the last five years. 
we are currently going through, just finished submitting our fifth quality rating process. As a rated facility, we have been fortunate to receive the rate differential in child care assistance and provide much needed scholarships for the children that we serve. This small increment of increased funding has meant so much for our center. The rate differential has allowed us to increase staff wages which I believe has directly impacted turnover at our facility. We have also seen an increased interest in educational opportunities and access to quality staff. As I said earlier, I own the only child care in Norman, the only child care center in Norman County. We are in the process of opening a second site in a neighboring community and a third site, which will be an after school only site in Ada. My fear has been not that we wouldn't have children to attend our new site. We know that children need care. My fear has been that we wouldn't be able to find teachers to work in the new facilities. We want to be able to serve children and families in our community. We want to be able to support our small rural area by providing much needed child care. But we need to have people who can afford to work in this field. There are many who want to work with children, we see it all the time, but they start and then they can't afford to continue because they can't, they can't live off of the low wages that an early childhood career typically provides. This tax credit bill would directly impact our ability to recruit and retain a quality workforce. This tax credit for early educators, that investment of just $1,000 to $3,000 per teacher, would make a world of difference to teachers and their families. I wish this had been around when I was a family child care provider. It was really hard to further my education when I was working from home 60 hours a week over that 16 years. Incentives like, incentive like these would have been welcomed and I believe they would have encouraged me far earlier to pursue my special education degree. There are a few opportunities tied directly to having higher star rating through parent aware. But what I love most about this particular bill is that you can just be starting out with the parent aware process. You can be building up from a one star to a six star rating and you can still receive these tax credits. It really is a great opportunity. I also wanna make sure that we aren't forgetting about the children and families we serve. All families, regardless of their ability to pay, deserve the opportunity to have their children in quality rated programs programs that are making a conscious effort to provide high quality care and education. This tax credit bill provides incentives for all of those serving children to become quality if they aren't already and do some very basic things that we know lead to better outcomes for children. This bill also encourages parents to choose high quality programs for their children to ensure that we truly bridge that achievement gap in our state. So with that, I ask you, why wouldn't we give more incentives to providers to enter the parent aware system? Why wouldn't we make choosing quality childcare more affordable for, for parents? Why wouldn't we put more money in the pockets of quality childcare providers, both family childcare and center-based to help attract and retain great providers in our field? Why wouldn't we help incentivize more quality providers to serve our higher risk children? why wouldn't we support SF 934? Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Mr. Boss, and thank you uh, for all the work that you do to care for children. Uh, next, I understand we have one more testifier, uh, Claire Sanford, and uh, Ms. Sanford, please uh, try to keep your comments to a minimum. We are uh, already over our committee's uh, allotted time, but at the same time, we wanna hear your important comments. So please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. My name is Claire Sanford, and I am the Government Relations Chair on the board of the Minnesota Child Care Association. Thank you so much, Senator Nelson, for your commitment to this bill and to our co-authors. Um, Mr. Chair, you are one of them. We are here, as you've heard from these two fantastic providers, because we don't value our providers enough financially and child care plays a critical role in Minnesota's economy. These numbers are pre-pandemic, but pre-pandemic, um, the National Committee for Economic Development was estimating that 2.25 billion in annual state economic impact came from the paid child care industry. And 73% of Minnesota kids birth to five had all available parents in the workforce. Yet we are in crisis all over the state. 
Everyone wants to create and retain more childcare, but it's incredibly difficult to attract and retain skilled people in a low wage field. And nationwide, about 50% of childcare providers earn so little that they use public assistance. So it's not like we're not already paying for this in some way. We have to be very smart about our response. We need skilled, trained, and educated professionals for the brain's most rapid period of growth is between the ages of birth and five. And high quality early childhood programs are the only kind shown to provide significant return on our investment. We can't provide high quality at scale without significant change in the early childhood workforce. This bill is intended to be another tool in the toolbox along with other ideas on the table this session. And I'd like to point out that a few years ago, the National Governors Association worked with Minnesota specifically on childcare workforce issues and a quality and credential linked refundable credit like this was its top recommendation for Minnesota. I'll give a few quick highlights from what happened, for example, in Louisiana after they implemented a credit like this. The Louisiana model for credits focused only on childcare centers, whereas ours is open to both childcare centers and family childcare providers because we know family childcare providers are so important in the system, particularly in greater Minnesota. And in Louisiana, the governor's economic development budget actually included this credit as an investment in small business. The number of quality rated programs doubled in the first few years and grew to about 75% of all providers being rated, which is far higher than Minnesota currently has. There was a substantial increase in low income families who were then choosing those higher rated programs. And there was a gradual ramp up, of course, over the first few years, which the fiscal points out. But eventually, there was a 250% increase in staff claiming the credit. And the average credit they were getting was equal to one month's mean wages, which is incredibly meaningful for people in an economically precarious position. In the first eight years of the Louisiana credits, child care professionals achieving that first tier of education, the Child Development Associate Certificate, increased 374%. And we know from research that the education of providers is directly linked to the outcomes we will see in children. So in conclusion, this package is a powerful combination of investing in the child care workforce while increasing quality levels of programs and adding attracting more providers. Supply for supply's sake is short-sighted. We must ensure that supply and quality go hand in hand, and Senator Nelson has been a longtime leader on that very issue. So it is our hope that Minnesota adopts this effective, innovative, and recommended strategy. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Sanford, for your testimony, and thank you for all you do for our children. Uh, members, uh, any questions? Senator Nelson, uh, any final comments? I uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. Uh, I, this is a critically important issue, and uh, we have this this dual uh, pandemic uh, facing our kids. Uh, number one, the lack of childcare providers, and the fact that so many of our kids enter kindergarten not ready to learn, and the uh, repercussions from that. And this proposal addresses both the shortage and the fact that Minnesota has this persistent a nation leading achievement gap. And uh, because of that, I just want to mention the letters of support that are uh, posted online so that members and the public uh, can reference these uh, letters of support. Uh, first children's finance support letter, West Central initiative support letter, transforming Minnesota workforce support letter, think small support letter, close gaps by five support letter, YMCA's support letter, Kristen Jackwith support letter. And I just wanna thank the committee for their time, particularly today, I know we went over a bit and I would uh, renew my motion that Senate file 934 as amended um, be laid over. It, it will be laid over for possible inclusion. All right, members, uh, Senate file 934 as amended will be laid over for possible inclusion. Senator Nelson, you wanna close us out? Yes. Uh, thank you, members, for your additional time today. I greatly appreciate it. It was a, a very uh, important hearing. Appreciate your time. With that, our committee is adjourned. Our next meeting will be April 12th. Thank you so much. <laughs>